Thanks so much for joining us today. We'd love to know how God is using this ministry to touch your life. So please take a moment and send us your story by going to ChristianLifeRantool.com and clicking on Amen Central. Thanks again for joining us, and we hope you enjoy today's message. Welcome to Fresh Start, our first service of 2016. You know, I'm willing to bet that some of you in this room can relate to some of the things on those lists. On that poster board you saw up there, fear, doubt, anger. For some of you, that's what 2015 was like. Some of you, it was a year of frustration. I'm just willing to bet in a room this size, for some of you, it was a tough year. Maybe you found yourself stuck in a cycle of defeat, or maybe you felt trapped in a series of addiction and uh, unhealthy relationships. And maybe you would say to me, Barry, it wasn't just that it was two steps forward and one step back. It was more like it was one step forward and two steps back, continually losing ground. Well, I'll tell you what, you know what I love about New Year's? It's a time for a fresh start. Isn't that right? But you know what? With God, it's even better than that. And I think we heard that from Eric this morning. Because with God, every day is an opportunity for a fresh start. Right? His mercies are new. How often? Somebody help me out. Every morning, God truly makes all things new. But there's just something about New Year's where we have the opportunity to evaluate our lives and then make some meaningful changes. And we want to help you to do that. So we're kicking off this series called Fresh Start, it's corresponding with 21 days of prayer and fasting and hopefully journaling, and that starts tomorrow. And this morning's message I titled, Start Here. In other words, if you're ready to make some positive changes in your life, if you're ready to beat that cycle of defeat and negativity in your life, if you're ready to move forward, I'm going to tell you where to start. I want to start by looking at a person in the Bible who stood before Jesus expecting to be executed And yet she was given a fresh start. Her story is recorded in John chapter 8. If you have your Bibles, you could turn to John chapter 8. Everybody has mobile devices these days. I I miss hearing the rustling of pages. Verse 1, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Now early in the morning he came into the temple and all the people came to him and he sat down and taught them. Then the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now there's something I catch right off the beginning in this story. And that is that she didn't commit adultery by herself. So where's the guy? Where's the guy? Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? And they said this, testing him that they might have something to which accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. I I love Jesus. You never see Jesus in the Bible just rattled or frustrated, right? He's always calm. He's always cool. He's always collected. There's never a crisis with Jesus. And that's how he works in our lives as well. But for this woman, there was a crisis. There really wasn't a crisis. And And I say that because there was no chance of her getting stoned this day. Okay, because at this point in history, Judah was a Roman occupied territory. Only Rome can give the authorization for the death penalty. That's why they had to go to Pilate, the Roman governor, to get permission to crucify Jesus. So she's really not in danger, but you got to look at things from her perspective. She wouldn't have understood that. She was pulled away from her lover in the middle 
of an adulterous act, the Bible says, and there's, it's unlikely she was even fully dressed. And here she was, and these guys probably have rocks in their hands, and they're setting Jesus up for a trap. And the trap is this, that if he says that no, they should not stone her, then they have room for accusation against him, that he is not upholding the law of Moses. In fact, this is what they eventually get him crucified on. But if he says, yes, go ahead and stone her, then his message of mercy and reconciliation and love of the Father doesn't hold merit. So Jesus apparently is trapped. But how many of you know every time somebody tried to trap Jesus, that didn't end well for him? And it doesn't end well here neither. But I want to concentrate on this woman for a minute because every time I had ever read this, and last time I preached on this passage, I focused on her fear. Could you imagine the fear that she must have had? I mean, I don't know how she was able to stand. And then yesterday, as I meditated on this verse, it occurred to me that her primary, I'm sure she had fear, but her primary emotion was not that of fear. Why do I say that? Because if you were afraid, what would you do? I'd say you'd do one of two things. You'd either deny it, right? Say, hey, listen, I was just getting ready to get in the shower. I don't know. These guys dragged me out here. I didn't do any of this stuff. Right, But that really wouldn't hold up because at this point in history, a woman's opinion means nothing and it doesn't stand up to the testimony of a man, especially a group of men. So what she like, more likely would have done is she would have fallen at the feet of Jesus and pleaded for mercy, but she doesn't. And that's peculiar to me. Why would she not plead for mercy if her life is at risk? You know why I think it was? I think that she had this combination of emotions going on and it was kind of, it, on the one hand, she felt utterly worthless and I think that her humiliation must have been just about unbearable and and it's hard for us to understand that with a 21st century American mindset but I want you to think about this if you will in in our culture we celebrate sin okay whether we really actively think about that just watch prime time tv and you'll find out that we celebrate sin in our nation but did you know that there are women in america who intentionally leak their own sex tapes in order to become famous do you understand this is the world that we live in in her world though adultery was a sin not only was it a sin it was a crime a capital offense worthy of the death penalty and imagine the humiliation as she's looking at Jesus, and she knows that he's been called the Messiah. He may be the chosen one. Probably no man in the history of her life has ever showed her compassion. And now Jesus is looking at the ground like he doesn't care neither. She's probably thinking, you want to smash my face in with rocks? It'll hurt less than my everyday life. Go ahead. I think that that is where this woman is. But Jesus is getting ready to turn the tables. In verse 7 it says, So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and he said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And again he stooped down and he wrote on the ground. Then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in his midst. When Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Pray with me. Father, I just pray that you help me to rightly divide your word this morning. God, I pray that the Holy Spirit would speak to each of us. And Father, show us how this word is applicable to our life. God, let us leave here not with a self-confidence, but with a God confidence that if our God is for us, who can possibly be against us? And God, let this be a fresh start in our lives. Let this be a day where we begin to set out in purpose to give you our very best And God, at the end of the year, we will celebrate what you've done through our obedience. And we just thank you and praise you for it. And God, we say, do it for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have your sermon notes, I'm going to give you two felons at once. That's probably never happened in the history of Christianity. Pastor gives you two felons at once, but here they are. Number one is God's perspective, and number two is repentance. God's perspective and repentance. When I talk about God's perspective, I'm saying having a proper understanding of how God sees you. Now, I, I'm giving you both at once because I didn't even know which one to put first. Really, if you're going to make positive progress with God, 
everyone knows that that begins with repentance, right? But the way I see it, that unless we have a proper perspective on how God sees us, we, we may um, get in line out of the fear of maybe God's going to whack us, but that's worldly sorrow, right? That, that's the sorrow in our hearts is that we may face a consequence for our sin, and that's not what God wants. God doesn't want us to modify our behavior to avoid punishment, Jesus didn't say, if you're terrified of me, obey my commands, right? What did he say? He said, if you love me, obey my commands. And that's what he wants our motivation to be, out of the love that he has for us. And I think about this woman, and I'm guessing every man that she ever encountered had one of two reactions to her. Either he lusted after her and wanted to use her, or she disgusted him. But the first time that someone else, in this case Jesus, gives her a different reaction, he shows her compassion, it's enough to convince her that he's God. And you say, where am I getting that? She called him Lord. And Lord has a lot of different meanings. Lord could just mean sir, but that's not the word she used here. She used kyrios. Kyrios in the Greek is a rendering of Adonai in the Latin. It's not just God, it's my God. What she was saying to him is master. He showed her compassion. She called him master. Can I tell you, church, the, the word of God says that God's kindness leads us to repentance. And, and what you think about, Tozer just nailed this when he said, what you think about when you think about God is the most important thing about you. Let me say that again. What you think about when you think about God is the most important thing about you. We have two dogs and I always said we'd never get pets and then I got pets and I said I'd never use them as sermon illustrations but they give me such good material they really do but they have all these toys right they got little chew toys they got little balls little bones I mean everything right these are the most pampered pups on the planet but but what they really like is garbage And they're little lap dogs, so the only thing they can reach is our bathroom garbage cans. And they just love tissue. Oh, if they find tissue, it's just a heyday. So last week, I go into our bathroom. Someone left the door open, probably me. And I find (laughs) tissue everywhere. Now, this is real simple with my dogs to figure out which one did it. All I got to do is go out there, and they have a typical response. So I go out there, and I'm looking. One of them's just going to look at me like nothing, but the other one's going to look guilty. He's going to back up. But I go out there. I said, who did this? And they both back up. (laughs) So I was like, get in here. And they come, tail between the legs. And I said, who did this? And I pointed. And they both at the same time fall on their back with their paws straight up, right? (laughs) That's their way of submitting. Now, they don't repent, okay? Because the next chance they get, they're going to be in there again, right? But this is what the dogs get right. The next morning, I'm in prayer, and I'm still a little ticked off at the dogs. In fact, I told the boys, go put those things to bed. And and in the morning, I wake up. I'm on my face in prayer. I got a blanket above me. I don't even hear them come up. And then at the same time, they both sneak under my blanket, and they're licking my face, right? (laughs) They they don't repent, but, but they run right to their master afterwards as if nothing ever happened. The reality is they don't even remember, right? And I think that's what dogs get right, and I think that's what we get wrong right? We, we play in the garbage, and then we run from our master, and we hide from our master. In church, we've been doing it since the garden. And what God would like to say to us today is that it doesn't have to be this way. He is quick to forgive. He is quick to overlook an offense. All we have to do is sincerely repent. And guess what? You want to know the reality, the theology behind the whole thing? You're forgiven as a child of God. Now, I'm assuming you're in a relationship with Jesus Christ. But if you are, you're forgiven before you even ask. But what confession and repentance does is it restores the relationship. And it gives us that closeness and intimacy. And Satan has convinced us to run and hide from God. And I think we heard that in the prophetic this morning, instead of running to the arms of a loving Savior. And that's what God wants from us. What you think about when you think about God is the most important thing about you. And church, he loves you. He, he cherishes you. The Bible says that he dances over you. Can you picture that? God twirling and dancing he's so excited over you and God doesn't have favorites we're all his favorite he's doing this 
over all of us. And this woman feels his love, and it brings her to repentance because she called him my master. In other words, I will serve you. I will do things your way. Jesus' response is interesting. He says, where are those that condemn you? She says, no one condemns me, Lord. He says, I don't condemn you neither. And then he says, go and sin no more. That's an interesting response. If I'm really your master, Jesus is saying, then prove you belong to me by obeying me. Right? He says, lots of people call me Lord. In fact, later in Matthew, he says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will even enter the kingdom of heaven, but those who do what? The will of my Father in heaven. He said that there are going to be some on the day of judgment who come to him and say, Lord, we cast out demons in your name. We prophesied in your name. And guess what, church? It's going to be true. But he's going to say, unless you did the will of my Father, depart from me. I never even knew you. You know what repentance is? It's turning from our sin and it's turning towards God. Dietrich Bonhoeffer talked about cheap grace. This is how he defined it. Cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance. Oh, God, forgive any minister, any church that would preach a cheap grace. Listen, church, I don't care if you serve in ministry. I don't care if you founded a ministry. I don't care if you've given away millions of dollars to charity, Christian charities. I don't care if you've led thousands of people to the Lord. Without repentance, there is no forgiveness. Jesus says, go and sin no more. Now, what does he mean? Is she going to leave and never commit another sin in her life? Well, of course not. What he's talking to her is about is about practicing sin. I mean, she practiced sin so much that she's having a breakfast rendezvous, if you will. It says this was early in the morning. You understand that's not getting caught up in a moment of passion. That's as premeditated as it gets. You understand what I'm saying? And, and Jesus appealed to the Pharisees and the Sadducees through their conscience. Did you catch that? He, he, he said this, He was without sin among you. Let him throw a stone at her first, and then those who heard it were convicted by their conscience. But church, can I tell you, it's possible according to the First Timothy chapter 4 to have your conscience seared to the point where you don't even feel bad about your sin. Can I tell you, when I walked away from God in my teenage years, at first I felt horrible about the things that I was doing. There came a day where I no longer blushed about it. You know, conscience just seared. And can I tell you, in a church and in a room this size, it's likely that someone, maybe more than one person, is in and committing the same sin that this woman did, the sin of adultery. I can tell you this, that in, in a room this size, the statistics can't possibly not apply to us. So there are people who habitually watch pornography. Can I tell you, they're in a room this size. It's likely that there are people using illicit drugs and practicing drunkenness, right? And, and for some of us, it was only three days ago that we got to practice. And you know what? If Jesus didn't condemn the woman, we're certainly not here to condemn you. But I just want to tell you, church, that if you've made peace with the fact that you're going to live in sin and Jesus is okay with it, you're deceiving yourselves. And it's a very, very dangerous pattern to get on. I once had a, a man who came to see me many years ago. And really, he didn't come to see me because he wanted to see me. His wife sent him to me. And he was dealing with an issue of pornography. And after a couple of times getting together, everything's exactly the same and I'm just a little bit confused. Not that I'm expecting deliverance right away, but it just doesn't even seem like there's remorse. So I said to him, just point blank, I said, do you want to be free of this? And he looked at me, he just surprised me. He says, no. He says, I enjoy this. I work hard, and this is the one thing that gives me pleasure, and no, I don't want to give it up. And I said to him, I said, there's, we won't meet again until you get to the point where you do want to give it up. And I'll be praying for you, and I'll be happy to get with you in the future, but right now, there's no point of you wasting my time, because that's what this is. And it's predictable what happened next. Got offended with the church, and he left, right? You want to know why? Because you can't continue to come to church week after week, knowing you're living in sin, and be okay with it. It starts to weigh heavy on you. 
right? It, it's quiet in here, and, and I think that that's a good thing this morning. This is the most dangerous path imaginable. This is what C.S. Lewis said. The more often a man feels without acting, the less he will ever be able to act, and in the long run, the less he will be able to feel. You know, I got on the scale New Year's and wanted to see. I knew I put a little weight on over the course of the year. I thought maybe 10, 15 pounds. And I got on the scale 21.6 pounds in one year. And I'm thinking, well, you know, because we don't want to take responsibility, right? There's got to be something wrong. So, so my mind immediately goes, to, well, I've been working out. You know, maybe it's muscle. But I'm looking in the mirror, and muscle doesn't jiggle. <laughs> you know? And, and listen, church, I, I, I'm being really sincere here. I'm not making light of this. I think we make a mistake to, to treat a sin like gluttony. Now, there's people with metabolic issues, and, but I, I don't have it to the best of my knowledge. Okay, I have a refusal to push the plate away problem. And, and, and you know what? It's, it's something, honestly, I repented and got on my face before God this week and, and just said, you know what, Lord, I don't want to go into the new year. And I believe with the grace of God, he will help me to overcome. But A.W. Pink said this. He said that the Christian who stopped repenting has stopped growing. So I told you about two months ago, I was reading um, a, a book called Lectures of Revival of Religion. And, and I'm reading this book, and it's by Charles Finney. And chapter 3, chapter 3, Finney just categorizes sin, right? There's, there's just every sin imaginable. And he says, you got to do the hard work of examining your heart in all these areas. Don't even go to chapter 4 until you get this right. This is like two months ago. The other day I finished chapter 3. Again, I still don't feel released to go to chapter 4. And you're like, Pastor, you're that jacked up? Well, partially, but I would proposed to you that we all are right i like this is one of the things i had to repent of i don't really care about the condition of the lost you know like barry that's not true you know you you preach uh, on salvation you have altar calls of course you care well i do i do as long as it doesn't inconvenience me too much you see in november my wife and i are on a date night and we go out and we had a nice dinner we were downtown champagne we just park there and go to whichever of the restaurants we want to go to on a particular night. We, had, we didn't have dessert. We didn't have dessert because uh, Russell and Denise Meyer have this stand called Popalicious in the mall. And I want popcorn, right? So, uh, in fact, their mom prayed for me this morning, good friends of this church. But, but I'm, I'm going, I'm going to got my mind on this popcorn. I miss dessert, so I get this popcorn. Plus, it's our date night and our time out. This guy comes up on a bicycle. He explains to us that he's homeless. He says, sir, I don't want to bother you. I don't do this a lot. He said, but the reality is, man, I'm really hungry. And he says, can you take me and get me something to eat? So I open up my wallet, and I'm pulling some money out. He says, no. He says, no one ever gives me enough money to actually buy food. And I'm thinking, that's because you're not in front of McDonald's with the dollar menu, but, you know, I'll give you enough money for food. So I count out so he has enough money to buy food at one of these nice restaurants. And he says, Pastor, what do you do for a living? Of course, he didn't say pastor. He said, what do you do for a living? And I said, I'm a pastor. He says, I thought you did something like that. You look intense. I'm like, I've been hearing that a lot lately. <laughs> but I talked to him. I said, I said, are you a Christian? He says, well, all I know is somebody's looking out for me. He said, because here I am. Nobody's stolen my bike. Every night I don't know where I'm going to sleep. And somebody's looking out for me. And I talked to him a little bit about the Lord. But, but this is what I felt the Holy Spirit nudging me to do was to go take him and go sit down and have dessert while he eats, you know? But my mind's on popcorn, you know? I mean, it really is, it's not even funny. It, really what I was saying to God is, you know what, I'm off the clock, you know? I work and I serve your people. This is date night. You can't touch this, right? Long before ministry was my occupation, ministry was my passion. Ten years ago, there's no chance that I didn't have a very long conversation minimally and probably took him out to dinner and shared the love of the Lord with him. And I'm just telling you, church, as I examine my heart more and more, and Finney talks about the breaking up of the fallow ground, this is the only way we really get better. Because point three in your outline, we're going to talk about spiritual discipline. 
But it doesn't matter without repentance. You can read the Bible, you can fast, you can pray, you can do a daily devotion, you can do all these things in ministry, but if your heart's hard, you're not going to receive from the Lord. But Finney says, when you will break up, and how do you break it up? By staring at it, by looking at it, by reading chapter 3 of his book so many times that you're ready to scream, but then you read it again because you know that there's still stuff there, and it breaks it up. And can I tell you the tears have begun to flow again? Can I tell you the compassion for the lost, among many, many other things, has begun to flow again. And church, isn't that what we want? Isn't that what we want? Thomas Watson said, till sin be bitter, Christ will not be sweet. Now the good news is, God will never turn away a broken and contrite heart. And I just want to tell you, church, there have been prophecies over this church. And if you've been here long enough, you've heard them. We've had guest speakers come through, and they said this is going to be a place of revival. This is going to be a beacon to our community. We are going to break out. But can I tell you, until we come to a place of corporate brokenness, it's never going to happen. We'll see incremental change as one person gets right with God and then another person gets right, but it's going to take this big move of God, and God, we've got to be willing to, to be part of the process. I want to talk to you lastly about spiritual discipline. The quality of your life and the quality of my life is essentially comprised of your habits. Psychologists have come up with this tool to help primarily people in recovery be able to see when they're at risk of falling back into their addiction. They call it the PCI, or the Personal Craziness Index. But I think the Personal Craziness Index applies to all of us, and I'll explain. But this is how it would work in addiction, just to give you a hypothetical example. Maybe on someone's Personal Craziness Index is they cannot stay up late at night because it affects too many other things, okay? So they stay up late at night, and then the next day they, they sleep in. They don't have time to shower, so they're rushed getting to the job. They're, they're feeling kind of grimy, and they got a bad attitude because they're tired, and they go in, and their boss gets all over them about their attitude and their appearance, and then at the end of the day, they're looking for the drug dealer as some way to take off the tension for their kind of day. You understand what I'm saying? For me, and this may sound silly, but on my personal craziness index is flossing. And I know that sounds crazy, but if, if I don't floss, I'm less likely to eat well. And when I don't eat well, I'm tired, I'm probably not going to work out. And 21.6 pounds later, this is the result, all because I didn't floss. <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> you laugh, I'm serious. But you know, it works in the spiritual realm as well, right? Let's take that same example of, of you didn't go to bed early enough. And then you wake up late so you don't have time to get in the Word, right? And then you didn't get in the Word and you kind of feel guilty about that. So what do you do? You really don't pray throughout the day. And normally maybe you listen to Christian radio, but, but this day you're going to listen to other music because you just feel guilty listening. And then what happens? It's just this whole crazy cycle it's it's the pci and i'm telling you it all begins with our habits bernard nathanson died in 2011 and probably none of you know who bernard nathanson is but he was a champion of the pro-life movement this man was incredible he committed his life to helping people to understand that human life begins at conception and he narrated a film in the 1980s called silent scream and you say, well, what's, what's the big deal about that? A lot of doctors are pro-life. And you'd be right if you said that. But here's the thing. Bernard Nathanson did not always hold to that opinion. In fact, he was the co-founder of the National Abortion Rights Action League. In fact, he personally committed over 60,000 abortions himself. But then something happened in 1976 that he experienced that changed his life forever. It, it not only changed the course of his career in his life's purpose, but it brought him from what he called a Jewish atheist to becoming a Christian. And it was this, in 1976, the ultrasound was developed. And he was sitting in on one of the very first ultrasounds of a pregnant woman as one of his patients. And as he began to look at that, and they were almost done, he said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Is that the heart? And they said, yes, it is. This is a first trimester patient at the end of her first trimester. And he looked closer, he can see all four chambers of the heart pumping blood. And he said, I've been lied to. In medical school, they told me that it was just fetal tissue, that life didn't begin until after the first trimester. He said, that is no longer true. Conception begins 
birth starts at conception. And he changed his complete life's view. Why? Because there was a lie that he was believing because the truth was under the surface. And it took the ultrasound to be able to reveal what was underneath to get him to accept the truth. Can I tell you, that's what the word of God is to us. It reveals the darkness in our heart. And if you think you're doing pretty good, church, and look, I'm not talking about sitting around on a guilt trip all the time. That's exactly counterproductive to what we're talking about. Realize first and foremost that God loves you no matter what you've done, what you're doing, where you are. It's the only chance you got to actually get better. But look at things for the truth, and you've got to see it through the Word of God. So we're desperately trying everything we know to do to get you on board with what we're doing this year. And we're starting with the first 21 days. Starting tomorrow, fasting and pray, journaling and Bibling. If, you, if you're visiting with us, you don't even know what I'm talking about, go back and fill out a connection card. Someone back there will give you a journal, and they'll show you how to use it. And I want everybody to at least commit to three weeks. Can we do that, church? And I'm telling you, this is, this is what I can promise you, okay? I can't promise you that you'll have the best year of your life. You might not. I'm not promising you won't have any problems because you will. I can't even tell you that you won't get hit with some kind of tragedy. You might. But I can tell you this, that come what may, you will have peace and joy. If you purpose in your heart to put Jesus Christ first in 2016, church, I promise you, you will have a peace and a joy like you've never experienced before, and you'll be able to handle all of it. And this is what I can absolutely say with all surety. At the end of this year, when you look back, you will not regret the choice you made. And church, that's where we're going, and we got to get serious about this. You know, we're going to get back to normal messages and this and that, but, but I, one of the things the Lord's been convicting me of is not talking about sin enough. So you're going to be hearing more about it, you know? And, and if that begins to do something in your heart where it's pushing you away, listen to what that's saying, okay? Instead of running, listen to what that's saying. Thanks for joining us today. If you have any questions or want more information, please visit ChristianLifeRantool.com.